he created an illegal empire hidden deep in the heart of New York City. He wanted the good lifestyle now, and he wasn't going to wait. He had the appearance of being a legitimate businessman. When he saw the next big thing, he jumped at it. He realized he was sitting on top of a gold mine, and he wanted to capitalize on that. His thieves were the best on the street. We're talking tens of thousands of cars broken into. He was a greedy little boy who made $60 million. That's what made him a genius. In the 1990s, the streets of New York City were a haven for ambitious car thieves. We were experiencing approximately 150,000 auto thefts a year. Sometimes there were vehicles stolen just for pure export, so the whole car would go. Other cars were stripped of their valuable parts and abandoned. If you have a $10,000 car, it's worth approximately $30,000 in parts. Then in early 1994, authorities began to notice a strange new trend. Vehicles were turning up in mint condition, with only one item missing, the airbag. I remember being shocked learning that cars were being vandalized for their airbags. Law enforcement wasn't aware that it was such a hot commodity. It was a new phenomenon. And we had trouble convincing the higher-ups that we had an airbag problem. At more than $2,000 each, police soon realized someone was making a fortune. The profit margin in the airbags was un unbelievable. You know, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Police assumed the thieves were experts because no one ever saw them committing the crime. A trained airbag thief can take out an airbag in less than a minute. And once you get them out of the car, you're home free. An airbag, it's a lot easier to conceal than an entire car. I mean, if you steal a car, you need some place to put it. If you steal an airbag, they put it in a duffel bag and, and they're on their merry way. You might be able to steal maybe one, two cars a night if you're lucky you can hit a whole dealership for airbags in one night. We thought a lot of these airbags were going to local repair shops. We thought maybe they're getting shipped overseas. Everybody had a different idea where these airbags were going. The word in the street was there was a purchaser paying top dollar for airbags. Up against the wall! Up against the wall! Hands up! When police did manage to arrest airbag thieves, the criminals had no reason to reveal their buyer. The thieves caught with airbags, they would be charged with less of an offense than if they had stolen the whole cart. Looking at a misdemeanor charge compared to a felony charge, they wouldn't even spend a night in jail. We had to let them go. And the airbags themselves offered little help because they had no serial numbers. There was no way to trace them back to the car. For a thief, that's a really great thing. If you can steal something and nobody can really figure out where it came from, it's a success. You've done a good job. With police at a loss, the thefts continued to escalate. Airbags were disappearing from the heart of Manhattan all the way to Rhode Island. In 1997, in New York City, there's 45 100 airbags stolen. I mean, it was just unbelievable. We were scratching our heads, saying something big's going on here. You know, what are we going to do? The only thing that can account for that explosion is the fact that somebody was running a multi-million dollar operation. Police suspected the mob, but the mastermind was actually a small-time businessman who created the biggest illegal car parts empire in U.S. history and made himself millions. Like many new immigrants, Maurizio Percan and his family
came to the U.S. looking for the American dream. Mo grows up in a working class neighborhood in Queens on the poor end of the spectrum where most of the people are decent, hardworking, but it's also the breeding ground for organized crime. People trying to find their, their piece of the American dream through easy street. One of the things he wanted to be was affiliated with um, mafioso. Mob life is always attractive to, to the young. They're always wearing the nicer clothes, driving the nicer cars. They're successful. They have plenty of money. Bo wanted to live the good lifestyle now, and he wasn't going to wait. So Mo starts interacting with the sons of mobsters. He quickly learns how they operate. Organized crime has always been influential in car parts. John Gotti started off as a car thief. Seeing his ticket to both money and respect, Percan starts buying car parts any way he can. Mo Percan was getting his parts from thieves off the street, uh, local thugs who would go out and steal. He was selling auto parts out of the trunk of his car. He was selling everything, you know, anything you could buy cheap, he was selling. An item he bought for 10 could sell for $100. So, you know, Mo was doing all right for himself. But when Mo is starting out, he's his most vulnerable because he's interacting with street people. To counter the risk, Mo gets off the street and opens a shop in the Bronx. It's almost like a closet size operation where he's buying and selling stolen car parts. He camouflages his shop with legally purchased parts. So we wouldn't have that headache of worrying about the police coming in and uh, finding stolen property on his location. Next, he turns his attention to the local mob. You couldn't have done this kind of operation without paying up into organized crime. Mo wouldn't be where he is if he didn't have the blessing from somebody. Now he's under the protection of organized crime. As his business grows, Mo develops an eye for the parts that fetch the highest price. Then, in 1994, he discovers something new, the airbag. He instantly sees its potential. Once a vehicle is in an accident, the airbags were going to go off. And if the airbags went off, you got to get a new one. It was an item that he could buy cheap and sell at a, a very high price. Mo realized the airbag was the key to his success. That's what made Mo a bit of a genius. Mo now sets out to learn everything about airbags. He then recruits an elite steel crew. The thieves Mo chose were the best on the street very disciplined, people that he felt that he could trust as much as you can trust a thief. Mo well, we educated these people on how to take the airbags out, what to disconnect, how he wanted certain connections to be. Offering top dollar to his thieves, he unleashes them onto the streets of New York. There was no bond between Mo and his family of thieves. The only bond there was the money. Mo understood people. He understood what would generate loyalty. It was economic interest. He then turns around and sells each bag to mechanics for a bargain price of $1,000. From the car thief to the car repair shop, everybody was happy because everybody was making money. But Mo quickly discovers his thieves are bringing in so many airbags, he has nowhere to store them. He opens a new location called All-in-One. He moved to a warehouse that took up a whole city block. To unload his enormous inventory, he amps up marketing. He takes out full-blown ads. We specialize in airbags. And these ads would run in magazines or flyers designed to the automotive crowd. Mo has advertisements all over the country. He went from coast to coast. He has newspaper advertisements. He's advertising on the internet. Gotcha. 
his business takes off. Moe's getting orders from every place around the country and can ship these things overnight. Moe is making so much money, he realizes he can no longer hide his profits. Moe wanted a business that looked legit. If it looks like a place where they're doing illegal activity, you're going to be arrested. I think Moe's smartest move in his operations was hiring Eileen Kaloost. Is that you? She was a high school friend of his. They met at a party. And he kind of asked her, hey, listen, I have a business. Are you interested um, in working there? Eileen knew that the proceeds of the business were from stolen property, but she was able to figure out how to dummy up the, the records and the documentation to make it appear legitimate. Mo is so fixated in operating a legitimate business, he starts paying the car thieves in checks. He then secures the services of a check cashing company to process all his employees' transactions, no questions asked. With all-in-one set up like a legitimate business, Mo turns his attention to his thieves. Mo begins to insulate himself from the street people. He had lieutenants who would then deal with a crew. And those crews would go out to steal airbags. His operation is so efficient, he's soon running a 24-hour steal-to-order service. Mo could put out an order at 3 in the afternoon, and that would be filled by, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning. If you brought in an item he didn't want, he would attach it to a device and say, you know, why are you bringing me this thing? Because I can't use this. You know, it's basically entertainment for me. Mo Percan has now cornered the market. You could have had your airbag stolen from some one of Mo's airbag thieves and then replaced by Mo. His multi-million dollar business is so successful, he wins the coveted Dealer of the Year award. He had a beautiful house out on Long Island, some top-notch cars. If you saw him, you would think, this guy started from the ground, worked hard, make a legitimate business, and, uh, you know, good for him, good for him. Mo is finally living the American dream. But he doesn't realize his operation is about to blow up in his face. Maurizio Percan's airbag empire has netted him over $40 million. But he's still not satisfied. Mo is looking for validation. He was looking to become somebody, a player, a future godfather. He sees his chance when he meets Carol Montana. What makes Carol attractive to Mo is she's the daughter of an organized crime figure. She's a mafia princess. He wanted to fit into the family. So Mo's relationship is a way for him to grow even more. With the blessing of her father, Mo and Carol become engaged. But police have also been blessed with good fortune. One of Mo's airbag thieves, busted on another charge, faces serious time. The thief wants to give up information so he can get a reduced sentence. He goes, Mo buys stolen airbags. So it's like, who's Mo? I don't know who Mo is. He gave up the place all in one. He goes, you know, you go into all in one and this guy will buy airbags from you. That was the key of opening the door to the case. Police set up surveillance outside Mo's shop and quickly notice a suspicious pattern. It was like the same people walking into the place with garbage bags, walk in, walk out 10 minutes later with nothing in their hands. So it was like, what can they carry in a garbage bag? It had to be airbags. But authorities have no idea that Mo is on to them. He orders his crew to stop bringing in stolen goods. He was very, very careful. He had a lot of security at All-in-One. He had cameras. He was very suspicious of strangers. Investigators then try tailing Mo, but he proves an elusive target. Mo was very aware of counter surveillance. He used the old military trick of making three right-hand turns. Basically, you're making a circle. And once he did that, we knew he knew that he was being followed. 
we started exploring different possibilities on how to approach this guy. They try to infiltrate Mo's business. Catching Mo off guard, an agent attempts to sell him an airbag. Mo told our undercover cop, I don't buy stuff like that. Mo had his inner circle of airbag thieves. If you were from the outside, you're never going to get close to him with a stolen airbag. And after several attempts, we realized that we weren't going to get to Mo by selling him airbags. Then in 1997, Honda begins putting serial numbers on their airbags. And that was so helpful to us in investigating the case because if you recovered a stolen Honda airbag, you could actually find out what car that had been installed in. Armed with this information, police call in the FBI and the New Jersey State Police to help set up a sting operation. They call all in one to purchase a set of Honda airbags. We order a set of airbags, have them delivered. The biggest challenge is once we got the airbags was figuring out whether or not we could prove they were stolen. For the first time, investigators are able to trace airbags back to a reported theft. It was a positive hit. We got a stolen airbag. So to us, that was a, a home run. Police then obtain a sneak and peek warrant. It permits authorities to actually open something up, look at it, close it, and then let it continue its course. It gave us proof that the volume of business he was doing was incredible and in that it was stolen and not legitimate. But we wanted to gather as much evidence as we could not to just lock up Mo, but to put out, to put the business on them. Police now investigate all in one's bank records. We had hundreds of thousands of pieces of financial paper that we had to go through. The records lead police to the check cashing company used by all in one employees. Unbeknownst to Mo, the check cashing businesses were photographing each transaction. By paying everybody by check, it makes the business seem legitimate. But in the long run, all it did was prove that he was dealing with thieves. After 18 months, investigators finally have enough evidence to move on Mo Perkan's operation. So on Monday morning, we went to Mo's house. We had a uh, no knock warrant on his house, which means we could basically break down the door and enter the location. Police storm his house. But he's nowhere to be found. He wasn't there. That's the worst dream come true in a case like this. But police get a lucky break. Piled high on the dining room table was all the wedding gifts. Wedding pictures, there's a bridal gown, no, no Mr. and Mrs. Mo. We wondered, oh my, could he be on his honeymoon? But at that point, we really didn't know where he was. Police find the guest list, a who's who of the New York mob. The attendees for his wedding, including organized crime figures mixing with some of the uh, major uh, airbag thieves that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. On the list, they also find Mo's parents' phone number. Agents called his mother and told her that Mo's house had been broken into and that they needed to reach him quickly. And within 10 minutes, he called and I basically asked him, can I have your callback number and I'll get right back to you. Mo gives police his number. They trace it to a resort on the island of Maui. So we called out to our Hawaii office, and a couple of the agents went out and picked Mo up at his hotel. Maurizio Perkan's entire operation is shut down. He's convicted with transportation of stolen property and money laundering, and is sentenced to 10 years in prison. The best amount of airbag theft linked to Mo, it, it boggled the mind. We're talking tens of thousands of cars broken into to supply his business. Mo's scam was unique in that he uh, was able to conduct a very large business and make it appear legitimate. 
The word on the street, you know, Mo was the king. Mo was the boss. He was very well respected from the people that he, uh, you know, was dealing with. Everybody was making money, but Mo was making the most money, for sure. You had to give Mo credit. He was a good businessman, and he was a greedy little boy who made $60 million. And that's what he was all about. I would actually call him one of the smarter criminals I've seen. But like any criminal, he eventually got caught.